I've been here for 23 years, and, and Jim has been here for 42 years. Uh, <laughs> so there's several things I can say for his introduction, but this is a very special lecture. And we thought that we are going to invite somebody very special who knows Jim even more than I do to introduce him. So introduce Jim and is his daughter Elizabeth. <laughs> Now, Jim did not know that Elizabeth will be coming to make this introduction. You know, in most organizations, we give nice retirement gift, gold watch. I thought I'll give the better gift to Jim than he can ever get, his daughter. <laughs> Here. Uh, thank you so much, Mahendra, and thank you so much, everyone, for being here on what is a uh, very special day for me, uh, a day I outwitted my father. It rarely happens. Uh, that's not the only reason why I really never thought this day would actually happen. My father has been at Washington University since 1971 and at Olin since 1982 which I'm told is very many years, but I was a political science major, so I don't do math. <laughs> but to me, the, matters, the numbers have never mattered because I've never known it before, Olin. Uh, this is where I grew up. I've been running around Simon Hall since I was able to run. I've been stealing dry erase markers and sneaking into the library and asking my father, were all of the books that boring? <laughs> I tell people I'm from St. Louis, but it would be just as true to say that I'm from right here. Uh, I can't really imagine an after Olin. I suspect some of you may feel the same way about my father. Uh, I've met so many of you over the years, and I know that as much as Olin has been a part of our lives, so my father has been a part of yours, whether that's your work life, your school life, your drinking a lot of wine life. <laughs> My father, perhaps because he is stubborn, perhaps because he pretends not to be sentimental, perhaps because he's sometimes shy, doesn't understand this. A couple of weeks ago, when he thought he was telling me about today's event for the very first time, <laughs> he said, I don't get why everyone's making such a fuss about me. I laughed at him because, I mean, like, who would say that? And he sighed and he said, but Eby, I'm so bewildered by it. I've just been doing my job. Later that night, I was trying to figure out how he could say such a thing. First, I was tempted to blame temporary insanity. The Canucks had recently been swept from the playoffs. <laughs> but the more I thought about it, the more sense it began to make. My father and I come from a family of educators, academics, school teachers, principals, superintendents. But we're also Scottish, so we're very bad at things like feelings. Like, <laughs> like expressing the appropriate emotion when we could make a joke, unless, of course, there's whiskey or golf involved. <laughs> but what we do instead is share the thing that matters the most to us, the thing that we can't do without, which is our knowledge. Uh, do you know the first time I ever learned about the price and elasticity of demand? <laughs> Uh, we were having dinner at the pasta house, and Dad started drawing me charts and, and graphs on the back of a napkin. I was five years old. <laughs> uh, this is one of my fondest memories, because nothing makes my father happier than to share with me those things that fascinate and excite him, not just economics, but French Revolutionary history, Chinese art, jazz theory, family guy. <laughs> it's, this is a true fact. <laughs> and nothing makes me happier than to have the chance to bask in the glow of that enthusiasm. 
And, and this is what he doesn't understand. This is, why, this is why we're making a fuss, because he thinks that this is just about work, when in fact this is about how an exceptional person can change what the very idea of work means, be it as a teacher, as a scholar, as an administrator. For my father, students are not so very different from family. And while I've never officially been his student, God knows my econ grades would have been better <laughs> if I had, I know how he has invested himself in my life and my education and my happiness, which means that I also know a little something about how he's invested himself in all of yours. In other words, Dad, you have no one to blame for all of this but yourself. <laughs> Uh, and so it is with great pleasure and tremendous pride that I introduce my father, James Little, your colleague, professor, and friend. I'd advise you all to sit. You see, I have a very thick <laughs> set of notes here, and we won't get to the Knight Center until tomorrow if I can't get into this. I, I, I should actually say, though, that at my age, with my eyes gone, it's actually huge print. There are three words per page, so there's not that, there's not that much here. Uh, I, I'm actually very surprised to see Elizabeth here today. We actually made a plan a couple of nights ago that we'd FaceTime on the weekend after all of this was over with because it's my grandson's birthday tomorrow and I act, he's actually here so I'll get to see him. And now I have no excuse for not having bought him a birthday present so I'm just going <laughs> to... I'm just going to have to suck it up. I was going to say, well, the next time I'm there, I'll get him something. Anyway, thank you, Mahendra. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, hopefully, you came because of the promise of free food and drink, <laughs> and not for pearls of wisdom from me. And pearls of wisdom makes me break one of the first rules of public speaking, which is not to offend your audience right at the beginning. Wait till the end and you can get out the door quickly. <laughs> now, when I first started teaching, one of the senior faculty, who, who I later learned was a very nice and cultured man, advised me that teaching economics to freshmen was casting artificial pearls before genuine swine. <laughs> Hopefully you're all well past the freshman stage, so you won't be, you know, you won't be at all offended by that. And I realized he was trying to teach me two things. One was that economic theory, as much as all economists love it and revel in talking about it, it can be arid and profoundly boring to non-specialists. <laughs> Bart Hamilton is nodding his head at the profoundly boring part of it. <laughs> The second part, the second thing he was teaching me is if you teach, treat your audience like swine by not making, them, making relevant what you're trying to teach them, they'll behave accordingly like swine and fill in their teaching evaluations in the same way. So I'm, I'm going to try and be neither profoundly boring nor disrespectful today. And I'm going to do that by starting off talking not about economics, but about rather reminiscing just a bit about my time at Washington University. Now, I accepted the job here after spending maybe 30 hours in St. Louis. It might have been less. And at least eight hours of that were spent sleeping. Uh, and, y you know, I'm now at an age where it takes me 30 hours to choose from a restaurant menu. So, uh, when, I, when I look back, I realize I, I certainly didn't have full information. But I was young and cocky, and I was pretty sure I had the bailout option that I could go back to Canada. <laughs> now, sometimes you make the right choice out of luck or divine intervention, and I think this was one of those times. 
When I arrived at Washington University, it was in the middle of the pack among the research universities, albeit one with a great medical school and with ambitions to be among the very best. Now, lots of schools have such ambitions, but Washington University is one of the very few that's realized them. How did we do it? Well, obviously money helps, and we've had great support from our alumni and the community. But other universities have had money, and even more than we have. So what was different here? Well, during my 42 years, we've had only two chancellors, which is remarkable. Bill Danforth and Mark Wrighton. I don't think there's another university that's had such continuity of leadership. Now, what Bill and Mark have done should be taught in both our strategy and leadership classes. They had a vision and a plan, and like any good strategic plan, theirs looked far into the future and realistically provided for the university to develop the capabilities it needed. As leaders, they were equally effective. Universities are not easy institutions to manage. There are a whole lot of stakeholders, and they have conflicting interests. And I can think of few groups that are more difficult to lead than the faculty, <laughs> who are both empowered, which was a mistake a, a, a millennium ago, and inclined by their intellectual training to challenge everything. This is a nice way of saying we're a royal pain. But Bill and Mark managed to get us to work together towards that common goal. Now, the story of the development of Olin is perhaps even more remarkable. When I moved to the school, we were very much a teaching school with low research output. Many of the faculty who built the school in the 50s and 60s were getting close to retirement age. And Prince Hall, and there are one or two of you who remember Prince Hall, which sat next door on the site that is now occupied by the Danforth Center, was historic, and some people might have thought it charming, but it was completely inadequate, I'd say hopelessly inadequate, as an academic building. Now, like the university, Olin was blessed with a great leader, Bob Virgil. And Bob's first task was to build the faculty. It wasn't easy, because to attract the best and the brightest of newly minted PhDs, we needed the senior faculty that would, who would mentor them. But attracting senior faculty who were willing to bet on the future was really hard. Eventually, we succeeded. Now, Nick Dopich was the first, and Nick, in his curmudgeonly way, and those of you know, who know him will know that curmudgeonly is an understatement, and Bob, uh, and maybe good cop, bad cop in this, uh, Bob being the good cop, persuaded a group of senior faculty to take a chance on what Olin might become. And those first movers, Chuck Narasimhan, Phil Dibvig, the much-missed Dean Kropp and Mayor Rosenblatt, and later Amber Rao, together with Nick, formed the foundation from which we built the outstanding faculty we have now. Next came Simon Hall, and at the time it was built, it was one of the best business school facilities that there was. And of course, all of this took money, as I've mentioned, so the naming gift from the Olin Foundation was critical. And with this in place, we were able to hire some really talented junior faculty. Ron King, Bill Bottom, Todd Zenger, Guofo Joe, and Mahendra Gupta, who've become the faculty leaders of today. Now, following Bob in his 10 years as Dean, Stuart Greenbaum built on this. The growth continued in the size and the quality of the faculty. And Stuart made a major commitment to building our capabilities in executive education. The Knight Center, of course, is the physical representation of this, but more important in my mind was the expansion of the St. Louis EMBA program and of our non-degree offerings. But even more than that, for me personally, the boldest initiative was the move into China. Given what China's become, it's sometimes difficult to remember just how bold it was. There were a few other pro Western programs in China, but most of them were working in a gray area legally. No one in China was offering an EMBA, 
and the price we would have had to charge to just to cover our costs was vastly higher than any other program in the market. Washington University and Olin were largely unknown in China. Despite all of this uncertainty and the risk as to whether there'd be a market for our program at all, Stewart pushed ahead. And of course, that program has been a huge success. Now, we come to Mahendra. I could say equally nice things about him, but there's a rule in our faculty handbook. <laughs> and it says that faculty are only allowed to complain about a sitting dean and never to praise them. <laughs> right? Otherwise, the deans won't do what we tell them to do. And of course, we always know better what they should do and what they should not do. But I feel compelled to point out that if you look at the national recognition of the school and the extraordinary quality of our students, Mahendra has done a pretty good job. And Mahendra, I promise when you step down as dean, and that's not a suggestion, incidentally, I'll come back and say really nice things about you, too. Okay. <laughs> So I've been really lucky. I've had outstanding leaders both at the university and at the school. I've had wonderful colleagues who are really smart and dedicated to research and teaching. I've worked with wonderful staff people, particularly Linda Massey, who's looked after me so well all these many years. And perhaps most of all, I've had wonderful students who I sometimes think, and actually more than sometimes, think taught me more than I taught them. So thank you all. Now to the published topic of my, of my talk, the economic outlook. <laughs> now I should tell you I didn't choose it. I basically removed myself from any planning of this event, because as Elizabeth told you, I don't like any fuss being made. Plus it meant I had to wear a suit. Um, but I'm obedient. Now, not where the dean is concerned, but where alumni and development is concerned. All of us obey. <laughs> Pam knows. We all obey. We all obey alumni and development. So I'm going to provide a few thoughts on the economic outlook. Don't get your notebooks out yet. I'm, I'm not going to make any stock market predictions. As you know, I never do. And even though Bart Hamilton suggested that my talk should be about let's abolish the Fed, I'm not going to do I'm not going to do that either. Bart and I decided about an hour ago we'd be better off with a barter economy. <laughs> what I do want to talk about is the longer term, specifically what the global economy might look like 15 or 20 years from now. But to do that, I've got to go back to 1980. In 1980, 70% of the world's output, 70% of the world's income, came from the advanced countries. And well over half of it came from just seven, the seven members of the G7. The US by itself accounted for a quarter of the world's total. And that was just slightly smaller than the output of the 150 emerging market countries. Now, the population shares were, of course, almost the reverse. Roughly 75% of the world's population was living in the developing and emerging markets. Now, I assume that you all had a fine Washington University education, and that means you can work out for yourself the implications of that for differences in standard of living between the rich countries and the poor countries of the world. But here's a hint. In 1980, per capita incomes in China and India were 2% and 3.5% of per capita incomes in the US, respectively. Now, population continues to grow. Global population is going to more than double in the 50 years from 1980 to 2030. And the rates of population growth are going to be much higher in the less developed countries than in the advanced countries. By 2030, those countries will contain 84% of the world's population. 
So if we look at the future of the global economy from the viewpoint of 1980, output had to more than double just to keep up with population growth. And much more of that global growth had to occur in the developing countries if the gap between rich and poor countries was not to widen. There's some extraordinarily good news on this. As of 2012, the total size of the global economy is three times what it was in 1980. And the developing and emerging markets have grown much faster than the advanced economies. These economies are now four and a half times their size that they were in 1980. And their share of total world income has grown to 50%. Now that doesn't mean that this is a zero sum and that the advanced economies have not grown or are worse off. Despite the fact that we've gone through the most serious economic contraction since the Great Depression, the advanced economies have more than doubled in size since 1980. Now, taken together, and, and in particular, the performance of the developing and emerging markets, this overall performance has been little short of remarkable. And it coincides with the most rapid period of globalization we've ever observed. Now, I'm not going to attribute all of that performance to globalization, because it's also a period where, in which national government's policies how to put it, are more sensible than they were in the past. But I think that the, the opportunities offered by the increasingly open global economy were extremely important. And so I agree with those that have described this period of globalization as the greatest anti-poverty program in human history. As last week's economist, I must confess, I wrote this before The Economist came out. Uh, and this week they came out with something about Brazil, and I hadn't read that uh, when I wrote this. But The Economist is cover story of last week is exactly about, about this. And they probably wrote it better than I did. As for future growth, I, I'm going to get to that in a minute, but I just want to speculate a bit about the implications in the shift in the economic map of the world. In 2020, roughly 60% of global output is going to come from these developing and emerging market countries. China is going to be bigger than the US, probably in 2017, and will be the world's largest economy. The European Union, that was an economic power even 20 years ago, its share of global GDP will shrink even more than that of the US. And in 2020, it's only going to be slightly larger than the Latin American and Caribbean economies. Now, with size comes economic power. And that power translates to influence in the design of the international economic architecture. It's worth remembering that this architecture, and those are the rules governing trade, market access, international capital flows and currencies, and development finance that we have now were largely developed in the period right after World War II. The US, which was by far the largest economy then, didn't dictate the rules, but they had 95% of the votes, let's put it that way. Now, the system that was put in place was both enlightened and generous and was designed to promote free trade and capital flows, market access for foreign companies, and to provide financial aid and assistance to the poorer countries of the world. But with the growing weight of the developing and emerging markets, the influence of the US and the Western European countries is going to fade. That wouldn't make any difference if the newly influential countries shared the same values, the same commitment to openness, as, as have the US and the EU. But they're disturbing signs they don't. The recent selection of a Brazilian, Roberto Azevedo, as the new head of the World Trade Organization is an increasing sign of the clout of the emerging markets. The candidate favored by the US and the EU was Herminio Blanco of Mexico, and who has a PhD in economics from the University of Chicago, and those of you who know about Chicago will guess his views on free trade. Uh, and he is very much a free trader. 
Now, Mr. Azevedo, on the other hand, who is a career diplomat, he has frequently defended the trade restrictions put in place by the Brazilian government. And so it seems quite apparent in this that China and India are much more sympathetic with Mr. Azevedo's views than those of the Americans and the Europeans. Now, I find China's support of this rather ironic because China's benefited from WTO membership, World Trade Organization membership, I should have said that, uh, more than I think any other country. China became a member of the WTO in 2001. And if you look at the Chinese statistics, when growth really took off in China, led by export growth, it was in 2001. Then again, I'm not surprised, because China, the Chinese government has made moves recently to make life much more difficult for foreign companies to compete with domestic enterprises in China. India, too, should in principle favor the reciprocal openness that's been the core principle of the WTO. Now, it may be that I'm a pessimist. Economics isn't called the dismal science for nothing. <laughs> but while it may be fair to give the emerging markets more influence in our international economic institutions, I fear that this is going to weaken some of the very rules that made it possible for them to grow rapidly in the first place. And it certainly could end up making it much more difficult for the many countries, particularly African countries, that have yet to grow to do so. So where's global growth going to come from in the next decade? An obvious place to start is with the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, China, uh, and India. I got them out of proper order there, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Uh, Although it wasn't his intent, Jim O'Neill, the Goldman Sachs uh, economist who first coined the term, came up with one of the great examples of marketing hype in recent memory. There are brick funds, brick newsletters, and even now an informal organization of the countries with South Africa added because they needed an S so they could be called themselves the BRICS. Uh, it was South Africa, Suriname, or Saudi Arabia, I suppose. Uh, uh, I would have suggested South Carolina, having spent time there. It is something of a foreign country to me, but it's... Uh, and Elizabeth, you remember that as well. Uh, when is Elizabeth was quite young, we were on vacation at Kiowa Island, and this is when I was associate dean, and there was a hurricane came across, and... It was Hurricane Bob, and I said, he won't leave me alone even when I'm on vacation. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so, if we look at the BRIC countries as a group, the hype seems justified. Over the last 10 years, the BRICs have contributed about a third of the total growth in the global economy. Now, like group performance always, this is disguising the fact that the performance is largely because of the outstanding growth performance of one country. So if I were assigning individual grades here, China would get a high pass, India would get a pass, and Russia and Brazil, after some careful consideration, low passes so they don't come to my office and ask for a higher grade. The, the reason for this is that China contributed two-thirds of the growth of all the BRIC countries, India another 20%, which leaves less than 15% for, for, for Brazil and Russia. And their growth contribution was really quite small. Now, the contribution to growth depends on the size of an economy. And even in 2000, the Chinese economy was larger than the other three. But it wasn't very much bigger. I think that the mediocre performance of Brazil and Russia relative to the potential that led to their inclusion in the grouping in the first place might provide us with some clues as to whether we can expect China and India to be the engines of growth going forward. In 2000, one of the key, one key difference between China and India on one hand, and Brazil and Russia on the other hand, is that the latter were already middle-income countries in terms of per capita income. Now, middle income is a relative term. It's not how we would define middle class in the United States. You get to be a middle-income country when your per capita GDP gets to somewhere around $10,000 US. 
uh, per year. Now, economic theory tells us that as economies grow in per capita terms, potential growth rates decline. So we'd expect growth rates to be lower in Brazil than in China. But recently, economists have identified another growth phenomenon, which they've labeled the middle income trap. What we've observed is that for many countries, once they reach a level of per capita income somewhere in the range of 15 to 25,000 US dollars, growth stalls. Well, in principle, these countries should be able to achieve a higher growth rate and eventually catch up in terms of per capita income. Their growth declines to near rich country levels. Now, we don't fully understand understand this yet, but the tentative explanations do provide some insight into the challenges that China is going to encounter. China is going to come past this middle income threshold sometime in the next five years. Now, China's growth so far has been driven by four things. The transformation from a centrally planned economy to one in which markets guide the allocation of resources. The movement of labor from the traditional rural sector into the modern urban economy. Technology and know-how that have been brought to China by foreign companies or adopted by Chinese companies. And especially massive investment in productive capital. All of these are going to be less effective in the future. Unfortunately, you only get to switch from a centrally planned economy to a market economy once. Moreover, in the past several years, the government's even done some backtracking on this. And it's not clear that the new leaders have the political clout to change this. As for the reallocation of labor from the rural sector to the urban sector, there's still some room for this. But now, over 50% of the total population in China lives in the cities. And this has increased from 30% just a decade ago. Moreover, because of the one-child policy in China, China's population is rapidly aging, ultimately will begin shrinking. And by 2020, or shortly thereafter, China will actually have a smaller population than India. Now, that means there's just not the supply of young workers that there once were. And all of this gets reflected in wages, which have risen quite dramatically in the past few years. And these wage increases have led some foreign companies to move some of their China, if not all of their China production, either to other Asian countries or to Mexico, and even in some cases, nearshoring in the ultimate, bringing it back to the United States. Now, adoption of more advanced technology and know-how is something, is something else that can only be done once. And this, too, is largely complete. So what this leaves is investment as the primary source of high growth. The level of investment by government, state-owned enterprise, and foreign companies in China have been massive. In 2009 and 2010, half of all Chinese spending, 50%, went to spending on fixed assets. Some of this went into infrastructure, high-speed rail, highways, subways, and so on. But much of it went into property. Now, infrastructure spending can have high rates of return and thereby generate future growth. But just like any other kind of capital, there comes a point where returns to infrastructure fall. As an example, when Shanghai built its deep water port, the return was really high because of the efficiency it brought to shippers. But then every coastal shipper uh, city decided it was going to build a deep water port. And of course, the returns on those were extremely low, if not even negative. So something similar happens with property. In many Chinese cities, to say nothing of the cities that have been built that no one lives in, in many Chinese cities, there's been overbuilding of shopping centers and commercial office buildings, many of which seem absolutely empty. I suspect there's also been overbuilding of luxury housing and not enough middle income housing. So putting all of this together, I don't think that fixed asset investment is going to be the road to future growth in the way it has been in the past. So these factors are part of the explanation of why countries fall into the middle, in the middle income trap. Once the once and for all things have been done 
And once a country is invested in these high rate of return investment projects, growth has to come from somewhere else. And this is where growth becomes hard. There's some interesting examples in Asia that shed some light on the mystery. Now, South Korea stands out as a country that successfully transitioned from low to middle to high income in the 30 years since 1980. If it weren't for China, South Korea would be the growth story that we'd be talking about today. When you look at South Korea, it spends uh, its third in the world in the proportion of GDP that it spends on research and development. It has an extraordinarily high level of enrollment in tertiary education, tertiary education being universities and trade and technical education. Uh, now, similarly, uh, Taiwan has spent a lot on R&D and education spending. By way of, of contrast, if you look at Brazil and Mexico, both of which are typical of Latin American countries, they rank very low in terms of R&D spending and tertiary enrollment. Neither country ranks in the top 25 in the Global Innovation Index, and, and, and both Taiwan and South Korea do. And neither Brazil nor Mexico has seemed to be able to escape this middle income trap. Now, the importance of education and of innovation should come as no surprise. We know this from the development of the U.S. economy. The most important sources of growth in the U.S. between the 1930s and the 1980s were advances in knowledge, the things that come out of research and development, and education. So the issue for China going forward is whether it can make the transition from growth based on investment to one based on education and innovation. Now, China is trying to be able to, trying to do this, but I'm not convinced they will be able to do it. They're expanding tertiary education, but this expansion is really constrained by a shortage of teaching resources, to say nothing of the bureaucratic nature of Chinese institutions. I'm even more skeptical about innovation. It's not because I think there's something cultural that stifles it, but rather because I think there's something wrong with the incentive structure. That's always the economist answer anyway, right? It's incentives. And, but I think this is true. Now, to start off with, while the perception of many is that China has become capitalist, this isn't true. A market economy is not necessarily a capitalist economy. Markets are about the allocation of resources. Capitalism is about the ownership of resources. Now, in China, large state-owned companies, both national and locally, account for a large proportion of the domestic economy, and many of them are in a monopoly or near-monopoly positions. Moreover, they have privileged access to finance via the dominance of the state-owned banks through which the majority of Chinese savings flow. So they've got really cheap capital. There's lots of it. And so how do these companies grow? Well, they borrow more and they invest more in assets. The return is extraordinarily low, but their cost of capital is virtually zero. So they're still getting a positive return, and they can grow in this easy way rather than the hard way. Now, the competitive, privately owned local companies have limited access to capital, except through gray markets for capital. And a gray market for capital is something we don't understand very well, but the Chinese, being creative, have created one. But the cost of capital is very high. Uh, the cost of capital range somewhere between 25 and 30 percent. Uh, and so that limits, limits their access. Studies have shown that it's foreign companies who've actually made the biggest contributions to innovation and its contribution to Chinese growth. Now, this isn't a surprise since these companies who've been competing fiercely in mature and highly competitive markets for decades have had to develop innovation capabilities just to survive, something which the large state-owned companies in China have not had to do. So I don't think China is going to be the driver of global growth to the same degree it's been in the past. Who's waiting in the wings? 
Well, I gave India only a P grade for its performance, but India still has a huge potential to grow. It's a long way from the point where the middle income trap's going to set in. The population shift from the rural to the urban sector has a long way to go. India's birth rate hasn't fallen, so India has a young population. It has a vibrant private sector. Where India falls behind is in its infrastructure and its political and legal system, a system that's excellent in principle but dysfunctional in practice. A couple of years ago, I gave a talk here, uh, is China the next India? And I was really speculating on what the government was doing in regulating the economy. I hope in a few years I can give a talk, is India the next China, where Indian government has invested in infrastructure and growth really took off, takes off. Now, when I look elsewhere in Asia for growth, a country that I, along with quite a few others, think has huge potential is Indonesia. Indonesia's got a large and growing population. It's rich in resources. It actually is a net energy exporter, a significant net energy exporter. It's investing heavily in education. It actually has higher enrollments in higher education as a proportion of the population than does India. After the reforms brought about by the upheaval of the Asian financial crisis, its political system appears to be stable and effective. Foreign companies have already, dis have already discovered Indonesia, and it is one of those countries where uh, companies have moved their manufacturing operations from China. Now, when I look to Europe, the country with the potential to break out is Turkey. Like Indonesia, Turkey's a country with a young and large population. It has relatively stable politics, or at least it did when I wrote this. Things have changed. <laughs> See, this is the problem. You should wait till the day before to do it. If, if you're going to write newspaper-like things, you need to, to, to wait until the news is updated. Uh, <clears throat> Turkey has a huge advantage in its location. Next door to the very big market that's the European Union. Now, Turkey's not a full member of the EU, uh, and I doubt they will be in the near-term future, but more importantly, they're a member of the customs union. And that gives Turkey relatively tariff-free access to the European market. Now, the downside of this is that Europe's growth in the near-term future, as much as five years in the future, is likely to be on the very low side as they try and deal with their uh, sovereign debt problems. And Turkey's neighbors on the east, nice people in Iran and Syria and Iraq and so on, may actually cause some trouble. When I look at the Americas, for reasons similar to, to the reasons I like Turkey, I think Mexico may be finally in a position to realize the benefits of its location and of the North American Free Trade Agreement. Mexico couldn't have been unluckier in the timing of the passage of NAFTA because it came just as China was becoming the low-cost factory for the world. And at the time, wage levels in Mexico were high enough. Remember, Mexico was a middle-income country. Wage levels in Mexico were high enough compared to China that China was a lower-cost location, even with the higher shipping costs and the longer lead times and so on that serving the US and, China and Canadian markets out of China entailed. Now, with wages rising rapidly in China, the cost advantage has gone away. And we already see companies so-called nearshoring and bringing, bringing their manufacturing operations back to Mexico. Now, of course, challenges remain in Mexico in terms of governance and the level of violence and the corruption associated with the drug trade to say nothing of Walmart, uh, is, is a problem. Now, this finally brings me to the country that I think is going to make a very large contribution to global growth over the next decade. And that country is the United States, not surprisingly. Part of the reason, of course, is just the sheer size of the United States. But the main reason is US economic fundamentals, the same kind of fundamentals I've been talking about with respect to those other countries. 
yes, the U.S. has some problems. Recovery from the financial crisis has been agonizingly slow, but we've already passed the pre-crisis level uh, of GDP, and the labor market is slowly recovering. Because of the spending increases associated with the stimulus, but even more importantly, the collapse in tax revenues because of the recession, government debt has reached a worrying but not a crisis level. If you want to write that one down, please do. It is worrying, not a crisis yet. <laughs> now, the current political impasse over how to deal with this is frustrating. You wish they actually would actually talk to one another. But it, I, I genuinely believe that both political parties are, are committed to doing something about it. And the philosophical debate about the role of government and how to pay for it is healthy. In fact, I think it should be a constitutional requirement that we have this debate every 20 years or so. Uh, because if we don't, uh, government in some ways gets out of control. Now, our K through 12 education system may have slipped a bit in world rankings, but our higher education system remains the best in the world. And because of that, we attract the best and the brightest. With immigration reform, we're going to be able to keep many, many more of those people. And so we will have very bright, very well-educated young people joining our, joining our workforce, which will make a significant contribution to growth. Even with the huge cohort represented by the baby boom generation who are about to retire, I'm not a baby boomer, incidentally. I'm much younger than that. <laughs> My generation taught the baby boomers everything they know. And look how well we did. Uh, but the US doesn't have a problem of negative population growth or even very slow population growth that countries like Japan and several countries in Western Europe have because our birth rates have not fallen to non-replacement levels and because we're an attractive destination for immigrants. On the research and development side, our research and development spending is two and a half times the next highest in the world. More importantly, US companies are among the best anywhere in innovation. I hope business schools have a little bit to do with that. And the inclination and the supporting environment for entrepreneurship is here. So I'll leave you with some pessimistic messages and some optimistic ones. On the downside, I'm concerned that countries yet to get on the growth trajectory won't have the same supportive environment that we've had for the last 30 years. And so it'll be more difficult to lift those people out of poverty. Second concern I have is about future growth in China now that they've done the relatively easy things. On the upside, there are countries that can take China's place on the, as the global economic engine. And, but maybe the most positive message that I, that I have is that I don't think the US economy is in decline, and rather one that I think is poised for solid growth over the next decade. And I put my money on this one because I'm not going back to Canada, where I could have lived off the social safety net, <laughs> and even better, a social safety net which I didn't pay for, <laughs> and even better yet, I could have watched hockey on TV 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. I'm staying in the US because I believe in its future. Now. Just so you don't think I'm noble for doing this, I should point out that I'll be living close enough to Canada that I can get their TV signals, again, <laughs> again not paying for them, and still watch hockey 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and so I'll be in the best of all possible worlds. And just so you know, I put my money on Olin too. My finances, my financial future are in the hands of an Olin Emba alum. So thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope I wasn't profoundly boring. 
and thank you for the last 42 years, and I think it's time to go get to the food and drink. Jim, you can see from the enthusiasm and presence of this audience that these 42 years will not be your last 42 years. Uh, they will keep on coming back whenever you will stand here and tell them whatever you want to say, clock, <laughs> call it economics, <laughs> and just hope that they know a little bit less than you do. <laughs> The, the secret was always being a chapter ahead in the textbook. <laughs> <laughs> but Jim has been a teacher, a mentor, a holder of hand, and helper to many of us in so many ways. Uh, I invite you all to join us at the Knight Center. We are not going to have customary Q&A after the class, but you'll get plenty of time to ask questions. We'll have a short program there, but please join me again in giving him a round of applause. And Elizabeth, as you are walking away, Elizabeth, thank you very much for coming and making it very special for Jim. <laughs>